Uh, thank you for joining uh, Linux Foundation Research Turns 4. My name is Hillary Carter. Uh, I came to Linux Foundation three years ago to launch the research program. And uh, I'm happy to be joined by my colleague Anna Hermanson of LF Research. Anna, I'll hand you the mic. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining our session. Um, I've been working with Hillary on the research portfolio for a year and a half now, and um, I'm excited to share what we're getting up to this year. I think it's our biggest year yet, at least shaping up to be, so lots to update you all on. Thanks, Anna. All right, so um, what we essentially, uh, what our mission is at LF Research is um, to measure trends in open source and um, describe through empirical data how uh, research is um, impacting industries and technology domains as well as other reference frameworks. So uh, yeah, this is our mission, uh, ideally to, to provide empirical evidence on, to, uh, on the impact uh, of open source collaboration and how open source is being used to solve some of the most pressing challenges uh, in the world, everything from uh, improving uh, software security and using the principles of um, mass open collaboration to improve software, um, to address issues such as climate uh, impact, uh, to address uh, social um, justice issues, uh, and, and so on. So it's a very large scope. Um, and given the breadth and impact of open source worldwide, it's kind of a challenging task to be able to tell that story. Uh, through individual research projects. But this short video that we'll play uh, will uh, give you the high level view as to what we're all about. So it's just a click, right, Anna? Here we go. In 2024, Linux Foundation Research is launching a collection of studies on important open source topics, and we'd like you to get involved. Primary research is a benefit to the whole open source community, helping guide data-driven decision-making, improving brand visibility, engaging in thought leadership, and providing early access to insights. Our research produces valuable new data on open source trends within industries and technology domains and across other important reference frameworks. Geography-specific research identifies the unique characteristics of open source ecosystems in different regions of the world, informing resource allocation. Taking a data-driven approach to worldwide open source communities helps to reduce fragmentation and create pathways to greater collaboration. Our research also gives industry leaders an opportunity to share subject matter expertise for the benefit of others. Qualitative research is a proven way to engage stakeholders and bring fresh perspectives on the value of open source to new audiences. Analyzing software datasets from Git repositories or SCA vendors identifies trends in corporate contribution policy and informs approaches to making software more secure. So join us in creating data-driven insights that benefit all open source communities. To become a sponsor or sign up to participate in surveys, please email research at linuxfoundation.org. All right, so there you go. Um, you will have noticed in uh, the video uh, the use of a lot of infographics. Um, these are core deliverables of what we create, and they're nice because they're multi-purpose. They serve as um, uh, visuals that capture high-level data points and that can be shared in uh, social uh, media uh, posts and uh, presentations uh, quite nicely. Uh, so the, the core of what we're producing is um, often a research report, uh, infographics, and open data sets. Um, and everything that we do is uh, community driven. We create research for the community with the community. Uh, so we're definitely not able to do so in isolation. It is very much a collaborative exercise. It's, it's what I refer to as a, a team sport of a different kind. 
Since our inception, uh, we were launched in April of 2021. We have produced more than 50 unique um, research projects. Uh, this slide captures just a few of the covers of some of our more recent research. And uh, we, have in, we have research that, that uh, as you might have noticed in the video, focuses on four key areas. Industry, um, covering uh, some of the industries where the Linux Foundation has a strong presence, uh, the networking space, uh, um, financial services, motion pictures, if you're familiar with the Academy Software Foundation, um, as well as uh, automotive, if you're familiar with the automotive grade Linux uh, group of projects. And uh, understanding industry specific impact is, is very important and it, it helps uh, facilitate decision making and a strategy within industry. What makes one industry unique from another? Um, uh, and the, the needs of industries are, are especially regulated, uh, highly regulated industries like financial services have very different technological needs and approaches than those uh, that are less highly regulated. So there's some interesting industry challenges that we're helping to both identify uh, where open source is, is critical in addressing some of those industry challenges. Uh, one of our uh, commitments is to creating open data. Um, at a very high level, we produce open content. Uh, all of our research reports are available under Creative Commons uh, license. So you can download our reports for free, publish them on your own websites, share them, sell them if you want to, uh, as well as giving access to uh, the data, the raw data sets, uh, I should say, clean data sets that are free of personally identifiable information. And this allows our community to do their own research uh, with the data that we have gathered and create opportunities for testing the assumptions that we have um, made in our, or, or the, the analysis that we have produced in our reports and potentially create opportunities for a different perspective for if they use a cut of our data for a different approach. Uh, so uh, our commitment to transparency and openness is really um, fundamental. What we have found as, a, as a, a function is that we are creating primary research that really doesn't exist. And as a result, industry analysts from organizations like Gartner, you'll see Tony Iams um, is a Gartner VP, who's accessing our data sets on data.world for the purpose of producing their industry re uh, reports. So our ability to um, be a resource for leading analytics uh, firms and consultancies, the Gartners, the Foresters, the McKinsey's, uh, is really quite validating and rewarding. Uh, and they're really coming to us to understand what's taking place uh, quite broadly in technology and within industries. Uh, so if you're curious as to what our data sets look like, uh, visit data.world and look up the Linux Foundation's uh, collection of uh, research data. Um, it's, a, it's critically important as we create research to engage the open source community broadly. It's not something we can do in a silo. Um, uh, bringing together the points of view, the expertise across our community uh, is is essentially our, our value proposition. Uh, it's, it's vital that we bring in the unique perspectives of the open source uh, community uh, because that is what makes Linux Foundation research unique in the marketplace. Uh, and we would, we would just not be where we are today without um, a very a robust level of engagement. So I'm going to describe uh, some of the ways in which our community has engaged in the research process and for you to think about how um, research creates opportunities to engage communities and to bring in subject matter expertise. And we hope that we can be considered a mechanism for expertise to be conveyed uh, more broadly to a broadly audience uh, from anybody. So here's an example from uh, uh, spotlighting Stephen Augustus from Cisco. Uh, Stephen wrote the foreword, essentially the introduction uh, to one of our research studies on uh, maintainer perspectives in or uh, on open source software security, and it was hugely um, 
uh, validating to see somebody as high profile as Steven to endorse the work through his contribution and uh, the, which had the, the added benefit of Stephen then becoming an advocate um, by posting the research on social channels and really helping with the knowledge transfer. Uh, it, this is a kind of amplification that we just don't have. We have a great um, following community on Linux Foundation social channels, but there's nothing like community advocacy for your work. And so by bringing in people and thought leaders from our community and giving them opportunities uh, for uh, their own thought leadership and to have their, their take on a given piece of research is uh, something that we like to do and uh, see that it, it's, uh, it's catching fire. It's not always easy to get people to contribute to research, um, but when it happens, it's really quite magical. Um, a lot of organizations are um, constrained by their comms departments or their legal departments in terms of what they can say, what uh, needs to get approved. Uh, but when it comes together and people can, can contribute freely and with full attribution, that's when magic really starts to happen. So we were really grateful for Stephen and so many others in uh, uh, the open source community who have gone on record uh, to uh, uh, add to our report and be attributed in that process. So I want to highlight a few other noteworthy uh, contributors to Linux Foundation research here. Uh, we are um, fundamentally supported by the Linux Foundation uh, Platinum member community. Uh, through their membership, we're able to stand up new community projects like LF Research. And we have uh, created a platinum member benefit uh, so that anybody on our board can uh, participate in research advisory activities. So we host quarterly advisory board meetings, um, which are comprised of any platinum member of the LF that wants to get involved, along with others. Um, and we consequently have a, a, a very engaged community at a very high level. So Nidhi Araf, who's the chair of our board, has been a terrific supporter of research. Uh, she didn't initially join the LF Research Advisory Board, but over time she said, I really want to get involved and have, a, have an influence on the research agenda um, and be able to help make connections to uh, the interview process or help distribute surveys, things like that. Uh, Phil Robb from Ericsson also serves on the research board, and he has been equally uh, supportive, uh, conducting peer reviews of surveys, and his colleague, uh, Jimmy Alberg from Ericsson, has uh, written um, a forward uh, for research as well. Uh, from the FutureWay team, uh, Annie uh, Lai and her colleagues, uh, Chris Shi and uh, Yue Chen, um, Wen Jing Chu. Future Way is an extremely uh, supportive organization, highly engaged in research, and they have seen value in uh, uh, getting involved in research, providing sponsorship for research, uh, because these are door opening activities that uh, improve collaboration, that help with the project formation exercise, um, that help build the, the kind of building blocks for other uh, more strategic uh, um, initiatives. One example is Open Source Congress, uh, a, a live event that convened the, the open source um, leaders across foundations. Uh, in Geneva last year, because of FutureWay's engagement, they said, listen, we've got to bring all open source foundations together to have important conversations about how we can improve cross-foundational collaboration on, on issues that we all face, on things like um, how do we improve our response to uh, regulation that impacts open source, regulation like the Cyber Resilience Act? We are better and stronger together. Um, and research is, you know, often the first step in a broader conversation uh, to bring about collaboration because it starts with data. Once you have the data, then uh, you can build on the data and saying, look, the data says we should be talking to one another. Let's start talking to one another. And that's how it's happened. And that's the leadership role that FutureWay has played uh, with LF Research. Uh, Pei Jin, uh, who from uh, Huawei has also uh, sponsored research, serves on our advisory board actively. I think he joined in the middle of the night. 
uh, last night to attend our, our afternoon meeting, which was uh, much appreciated, or first thing in the morning. I, I can't recall the... Uh, which end of the day he was. Uh, Jessica Murillo from IBM has written forwards. She's appeared in research webinars, um, uh, hugely supportive. She also sits on our advisory board. Uh, Jochen Friedrich, also from IBM, has written forwards and has uh, supported our standards research in a significant way. Melissa Evers and uh, Arun Gupta from Intel uh, have commissioned research, have um, conducted peer reviews of studies. Uh, David Marr from Qualcomm has written a foreword. Uh, for an LFAI in date, uh, no, it was an enterprise, um, a guide to enterprise uh, open source. Um, uh, Leslie Hawthorne and Cara Delia from Red Hat, two active contributors, both in terms of co-authorship uh, and uh, contributing forwards and peer reviews. Andrew Aiken from uh, now Hedera uh, has been a co-author of research in the financial services sector. Elspeth Minty. Uh, from RBC World Bank is a unique contributor to research. And it, uh, RBC World Bank being a, a large uh, financial services, large global bank, essentially. It's a Canadian bank, but it is um, in the top uh, 20, might even be in the top 10 worldwide. Um, many times, employees from um, financial services organizations are prohibited from contributing code. But what they can contribute is their time and their talents to other projects. They can participate in working groups, they can participate in research, they can give interviews, and they're very, very active in the community. Um, and so that's one uh, uh, thing that we're seeing, uh, a, a great example of, of a person from a highly regulated regulated industry making active open source contributions. And it's really terrific to see. Uh, Liz Rice from Isovalent, uh, Brian Fox from Sonotype. Um, I need my glasses again. Paige Bartley from S&P Global. Um, Stella Biederman uh, from Luther AI and uh, Miles Borens from GitHub. So you can see a real cross section, people from industry getting involved, people from uh, you know telecom and IT vendors, and um, uh, it, it's just, it's a very rich uh, experience. Uh, there's a lot of um, opportunity to engage with some, some exceptional people, and they care deeply about the work that we're doing. So uh, this is our support team. And we're very, very lucky to have them on board. Uh, one of the ways that we recognize contribution is through Credly badges. There can be any number of contributions. In the previous slide, I, I recognize the ways in which some of our senior leaders are contributing, oftentimes at sponsorship or uh, writing a forward. Uh, but um, analyzing data sets, um, uh, maybe even ghostwriting a section of a report, being an in-kind contributor of one form or another, a data set contributor, um, a localization partner. Uh, we issue badges based on the level of, uh, or the type of contribution to recognize uh, that um, contributing in research is not unlike uh, contributing to the success of an open source event. As a speaker at Open Source Summit North America, I'm going to get a Credly badge that says I was a speaker, and that's a great thing. And so research recognizes contributions in that same way. And again, it's terrific when um, uh, folks like Phil Holleran from GitHub share their contributor badge uh, on LinkedIn or other channels to say, hey, I'm really happy that I was able to play a role. Um, Phil and GitHub have contributed data sets to the FinTech and Open Source Foundation three years in a row. And that data has been so valuable because it has identified people from financial services organizations, again, a highly regulated industry, and who is actively contributing to, to projects on GitHub using their corporate email address. And so we're able to measure, is this trend changing? And year over year, we've seen a terrific upward trend that now organizations, uh, banks, uh, asset managers, and other types of, of financial services enterprises are relaxing some of their policies around the types of open source contributions that their employees can make. And this is huge data. 
uh, Phil keeps uh, uh, contributing it to the Phenos Research Project, and we're very happy. And then, of course, we're really happy uh, that he's happy and shares it on uh, LinkedIn, too. Um, and so d diving into the kinds of questions that uh, we're able to answer through LF Research, um, m one of the most important questions that we need to answer is what's the most widely used open source software? Why is this an important question? Well, when we know what's the most widely used software, we're able to prioritize um, the projects that we ensure have what they need uh, in terms of security. Um, we want to make sure we know who maintains it. Is that maintainer in need? We saw this with XC uh, and the social engineering threat. Who maintains that software? What resources do they need? Um, how can we help them? And do they maintain a, a critical, uh, highly or widely used piece of software? And that's how we secure open source software effectively, is through this kind of, of primary data. Um, once we know this, then we can move to allocating resources accordingly. And this question has uh, been answered in our census work, most recently with Census 2, uh, a collaboration with Harvard's Laboratory of Innovation Science. And uh, Harvard has analyzed uh, data sets from SCA vendors, software composition analysis vendors. In Census 2, we had data sets from FOSA, uh, Sneak and Synopsys. So three vendors provided data that we could analyze and identify what the most widely used software is. It's not a perfect measure by any means, but it's a starting point. We're re-engaging Harvard presently to conduct Census 3, and we're hoping to work with more SCA vendors than just three. We have FOSA um, uh, committed. We have uh, commitments from new SCA vendor organizations and other types of uh, uh, cloud service providers. And what we hope is we can get a, an even more precise picture of uh, the world's most widely used software to then conduct the other activities and to direct the efforts of organizations like Alpha Omega, the OpenSSF, um, and so on. Interestingly, when the first census was run, I think it was 20. Um, 15. It was called Census 1. It was uh, exploring vulnerabilities in the core, and there was analysis done at the operating system level. Uh, in that um, research, XZ was identified as one of uh, uh, the applications then. And the, the, the debate is, well, you're giving um, malicious actors uh, a menu to choose from. Uh, but it has not stopped research. There are more people who think that understanding this research is more important than not doing it at all. And so we, we carry on. So we'll hope to have Census 3 out uh, this calendar year as we secure our data set contributions from, from our partner organizations. So I should say, if you are an organization, from an organization, know somebody who is, con who is considering making such a research contribution, uh, please get in touch. Uh, what do maintainers need? This is linked to uh, the, the census work. Um, and as a follow-on to census two, we identified some of the maintainers of the most widely used software at the application le uh, library level, and we interviewed them. To create this report on open source maintainers exploring the people, practices, and constraints facing the world's most critical open source software projects. And here's the high level, what they need. They need more time to respond to pull requests. They need more time to address vulnerabilities. And they need more time to onboard new contributors and think about um, the legacy of, of their, their project. Uh, they need tools to give them more time. And yes, they need funding. Uh, they need resources. So it, it's now up to us uh, to address and meet their needs. Another great question, how do we increase upstream contributions? Uh, this report. Uh, that we did in partnership with the To Do Group and others, uh, the 2023 State of the OSPO and Open Source Software Initiatives um, has some great data on engaging communities so that we can increase upstream contributions. Um, the big takeaway from this report is that uh, organizations with an open source program office are four times more likely to contribute upstream. So it really validates the, the uh, OSPO as a structure. Um, 
the work that we've done, particularly last year through our Global Spotlight report, uh, validates the open source value proposition uh, significantly. And that was a really um, uh, exciting finding. Uh, that there is widespread consensus in our community about the value of open source, uh, faster time to market, uh, a vital tool for innovation um, at, at so many different levels. Uh, the co the, the uh, benefits far outweigh the costs, um, that it's more secure than closed source and that it leads to overall uh, productivity and um, software quality. So these were exceptionally encouraging findings. Um, but not all research um, is, uh, produces uh, um, uh, encouraging findings. In fact, sometimes the data is uncomfortable. At the same time, that uncomfortable data helps us drive strategy. And it's very insightful in terms of how we allocate resources. Uh, our, our, the same study produced four findings that, um, it, that are sobering uh, and, and realize that we have a lot of work to do uh, uh, in terms of our communication, um, disseminating the value proposition and uh, um, making sure that policy stakeholders and other decision makers have uh, the, the, a better understanding of open source over time. So with that, I'm going to invite Anna up uh, to dig into the 2024 research agenda. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so as I mentioned, when I first got up here, we have a really big year this year, and we're really excited to be running some research with uh, a number of, of organizations across our community. And so I just wanted to give a, a bit of a picture into some of the work we're doing this, this year. Um, for example, how has generative AI impacted the technical talent market? We just answered this question in our research report, which we have in the front here in physical copy, which is exciting. Um, but we ran a state of tech talent report with LF training and certification to ask questions like this. How has Jenna AI impacted? How has economic headwinds impacted the technical talent market? We're also looking at uh, what is the economic impact of open standards? Why do, uh, why do technology organizations want to deploy open standards? What's the economic benefit? We also are asking, what, the, what is the open source value proposition when it comes to health data? How can we use open source technologies to better support the system that is currently quite monopolized by, by monolithic entities? How can open source facilitate energy grid on interoperability? How can we create a framework of, of uh, secure job, secure, uh, securing software uh, job descriptions? What is being used in the cloud native space when it comes to securing those applications? So we have a lot of different uh, research going on. Again, this is just a sampling and a few of these I'll take you through in a minute. We'd also like to highlight the, the amazing group of collaborators. Hillary went through a few of the individuals we work with. We work with a lot of entities within the LF and outside of the LF um, to support our research as sponsors, in-kind contributors, uh, research partners. And so um, you, know, you can see within our organization, we work with LF training and certification, LF AI and data. We also work with, um, you know, we're working right now with Natural Resources Canada. Um, we work within our, our member communities, such as AWS and Intel. So we're very lucky to have a lot of um, organizations that want to run this kind of research and answer these research questions with us. So as just mentioned, we recently published, I think it, two days ago, we, we announced the publication of the State of Tech Talent Report. Uh, this was, uh, I think, the... LF Training and Certification has been working with us for a number of years to produce a jobs report, and this is the second year where we surveyed actual hiring, technical hiring managers. And so this year, we, um, we wanted to understand the impacts of these economic challenges and technical trends in that market. And um, key findings indicate that you know, the Gen AI 
is not necessarily taking our jobs, but it is impacting the way that we understand and, and perform our, our jobs. And we also found that despite these large headwinds that we were, or, sorry, despite these large headlines we were seeing in 2023 about technical layoffs, it's a bit more of a nuanced picture than, than what, we, what we were seeing in the headlines. Um, so a lot more findings. Again, please come take a copy up here or scan the QR code. You can download it um, digitally. We also are running a number of surveys. We had we have three in the field right now with a few more launching. So this first one is a part of our World of Open Source series. Um, this is our global spotlight survey. The key to this survey is to, understand, uh, to provide a lens into what open source trends look like in different geographies. And so this focuses on the use and consumption of open source, contribution trends, how organizations and governments um, value open source, and so this will be this will turn into uh, a number of different reports that look at geographic segmentation. So there will be a Europe version, there will most likely be a Japan version, and then a kind of larger picture worldwide view. Uh, so this just opened. I think if you saw if you caught Hillary's keynote on Tuesday, this was launched uh, this week. Our State of Open Standards 2024 survey was also launched this week. Um, we ran this survey last year with the standards group, with Jory and Mike, and we found that um, we, we, we were really are trying to articulate what is the, how do you define an open standard, and um, is there a preference to open versus closed standards? And we found quite categorically that open standards were preferred by our survey takers. And so this year we're trying to understand why they're preferred, what is the value of, of an open standard and the economic benefit of this open standard. And so uh, in this sense, we're really look, trying to get the, the business and legal use case of an open standard. So this one is just opened as well. And then we have one that's closing, I think, in five or so days. But this is the survey we're running with, uh, with OpenSSF. And they, their goal of this survey was to understand uh, where there might be gaps in education, and specifically when it comes to developers who need to be educated on secure software practices. And so um, this one, we've already gotten quite a bit of sample, but um, if you have a say in this topic, please feel free to, to take the survey uh, before it closes. And we have two more surveys coming this week, so or in the next few weeks. Uh, the first one is the Open Source Developer Relations Survey. We've partnered with Intel, um, we're, who want to have a better picture of what developers need in their career journeys whether that's looking at the short-term career development or a longer-term career path. And so we're looking at how developers rank things like events, training, mentorship, and research. The second one listed there is the cybersecurity job role survey. This is also uh, some work we're doing with LF training and certification, and as well as ISC2. And um, the goal of this research is to validate a list of job titles and their responsibilities as they relate to secure software. And so we want the community's feedback on whether or not we've adequately captured all the different jobs that go into securing software and how we can make that comprehensive and mutually exhaustive. Um, I just wanted to to plug our, our research team. We have Steve Hendrick, who is the king of, of data analysis at the LF. He's He's been running uh, all of this research, and um, he's also been working with uh, three other uh, employees. We have Bianca Trinken, Trinkenreich, um, our newest data analyst, uh, Adrian Lawson, and Marco Girosa. And so our, we are indebted to them for running five surveys in a month. So. Um, thank you. I don't know if they're watching, probably. Um, and then I also just wanted, let me see my, yeah, I have a few more minutes. Um, we do have a few qualitative studies we're running as well. I just wanted to plug these. Um, we're running one with, with Futureway and MIT Media Lab on um, what does decentralized computing look like if we use an open source kind of approach or process. And uh, so the focus of this research is to understand um, you know, this concept of decentralized and federated computing as it relates to different areas such as social media, so thinking Mastodon, uh, software development ecosystems, payment ecosystems, thinking crypto, blockchain, Web3, and then also how generative AI will um, impact all of these areas. 
We're also running, this is a research project that I'm leading, which is near and dear to my heart, but this is a qualitative research study on how open source can be used in the healthcare space, particularly when it comes to managing health data. And so this is also, again, qualitative, where I'm interviewing healthcare professionals and technologists on how they perceive the use of open source and uh, as, as compared to other proprietary systems and what those benefits are. And um, so focusing on the databases that could be used and the open source tooling that could be used in health data management, but also what role does generative AI play in the space and how can we use that open source ethos of collaboration to build up a common data model, which is crucial for, for standards development in this space. And finally, a last uh, feature of our qualitative research is the research we're running with NRCAN, the Canadian uh, uh, Energy Resources Department. And so this we're working as well with LF Energy and the Canadian government wanted to understand how to get out of that vendor lock-in issue that has hurt them in the past when it comes to uh, their electric grid and, and the vendors they're using to power that. And so they're asking questions around who actually enforces that interoperability, um, what is the impact of IEEE standards, and how, do we, how can we use open source to better harmonize these grid protocols. Uh, so as uh, mentioned, we have a lot of research going on. We have a lot of surveys that we need. We know our, our research is really dependent on our community, not just from a, a sponsor or partnering perspective, but also from individuals like yourselves to take our surveys, um, to be interviewed for our research. We really uh, lean on our community to build out this repository of open source data. And so if you're interested in getting in touch, you can come talk to Hillary and I. Um, you can also go on our website and um, you know get learn more about, about the value proposition of, of joining LF Research and um, getting involved in our surveys. And that's it. Thank you all so much for joining. And I, I think we have, do we have any time for questions? Yeah, a couple minutes. OK, great. If there's any. Thanks for, thanks for sharing this. I'm, I'm a fan. I read, I can't say all, but most of your reports. Yay. I have learned so much over the last three years, four years. Um, I wonder if you can share a little bit more of well, now I know that you have a team, four or five people. I'm sure they're super busy slicing and dicing all the data. Um, yeah. But if, if you can share a little bit more of you know any uh, guidance or policies in terms of how you perform your research. I mean, I know it's not commercial, right? I read the reports, and I know you don't talk about any commercial software, even even with the sponsorship. Any any other. Um, I guess policies that you have when you are conducting the research, minimum number of uh, respondents, or that's what I'm, I'm kind of. Sure, I'll, I'll start, and then if you want to add anything, um, so so Steve and his team uh, work on a. We have a statistically relevant sample that we we aim for in each of our research, and so um, this is typically around the 300 mark for sample numbers, depending on what the. Um, what the client would or what the community member would like from from the data, but we do uh, always reach a stati statistically significant number, um, and then also within that research, sometimes we want to segment our data, and so Steve and his team are very careful to say, you know, is this segmentation statistically relevant given how many sample, um, how many respondents we have in our sample? Um, I think the. In terms of qualitative research, we we build an interview guide so that the the person who is conducting the interviews follows a, a similar process of um, of questioning, and so we don't kind of wander off too far down a path and uh, become biased in that sense. And so, um, speaking more from from the work that I do as a qualitative researcher, that's usually the approach we take. Um, I think we also. We operate in a very, as we work with the Linux, as a Linux Foundation entity, we operate very much in the open. And so we, we also rely on, on peer review of all of our research and anything that we publish in a qualitative perspective as a quotation, we get our interviewees to sign off on. Um, any other, I mean, we all of our research is, is published under Creative Commons. Um, do you have any other kind of thoughts? 
Yeah, so we build interview guides that we get our, our community to kind of sign off on. So, um, I mean, it, Steve has, is it 30 years of experience running qu quantitative research? So Steve has a really strong backbone of experience in this. And he, um, I mean, I, I come from an academic background and, and, and coming here, it, the, the same kind of rigor and lack of bias also exists in this process. There's, I think the nice thing about this kind of research compared to academia is that we're not mired down in, um, you know, the red tape of going through a lot of, um, you know, challenges to, or, or hoops to jump through. And so we can work quite quickly, but always with the mindset that we are, um, as we're open source, everything is transparent and we meet these milestones or these requirements that we set up for ourselves. Thank you. Hi, Stefan from SUSE. Um, signed up for my, my membership, so good job there. Uh, and research this morning for SSF. Um, question, though. Yesterday, I, I uh, in this very room, I think, listened to a very fascinating thing from the DOE. So similar to Canadian Energy, they're doing a research project for uh, next gen of batteries, mm -hmm. energy storage. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, is that something you're already engaged with? I saw the report kind of in that flavor, but curiosity question, keener question. I don't think we're, yeah, I haven't heard of that. Um, okay. It was yesterday around two. Did you see, catch that, Hillary? Yeah, I, I um, not specifically with the DOE, but we work very closely with LF Energy, and we do have a project uh, to work with LF Energy on this year. We're not sure the parameters of that project yet. Yeah, so it's more research and data collection. So many years and, and aligned with a directive for Energy 2035, right? So it's bigger long term. Mm -hmm. Fascinating uh, though. Yeah, like, like thank you. The, first, the, the, one, the reference was lithium research that they did in 1970 and how that's paid off now today, right? So wow. they're doing that again. Yeah. And Are they you? wanted to call, they actually called for help. So that's, that's why they were here. Now I should probably clarify also that the, the, um, uh, you know, we're we're not uh, uh, we're not doing R and D hands on, on in terms of technical research, more um, in in terms of uh, researching open source dynamics specifically. So I think that's where we're a little bit different than other organizations. That's our our niche. If there's an open source angle to the DOE's interest, then um, yeah, it would be a terrific collaboration. For Git projects, yeah. Um, did you have anything further? Any further thoughts, Anna? Yeah, just that sounds interesting. That just sounds that sounds interesting, and I think the uh, the NRCAN project is has been a little bit technical in terms of the standards and the kind of culture and dynamics around that, but less on the actual vendors and the technologies being used. But I I, I believe um, our researcher is getting into that a little bit with his with his interviewees, but um, yeah, it would be interesting to see what they're working on. And uh, we have a lot of American, he's interviewing Americans as well and, and Europeans. So um, this is specifically Canadian, but. I'll add one comment to say, uh, one of the challenges that we face is around interviewing um, or, or researching open source at the intersection of operational technology and some of the more strategic uh, infrastructure for governments. Um, nuclear uh, plants and, uh, you know, some, some uh, energy uh, strategic um, uh, operational infrastructure that it's very difficult to get the data. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's imperative that, that we do these studies to understand how can we be assured that these, uh, that operational technology is secure. Uh, so we need uh, different kinds of collaboration to think about going forward. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, appreciate your time and attention.